Welcome to the final episode in what has been nearly a four-year journey into modeling a seemingly simple subject. But if you've been with the series from the beginning, you'll have discovered, as I have too, nothing about this subject is simple. And to this point, this last episode will be a bit different from the others. This episode will not be so much a tutorial on building cases as much as it'll just be a demonstration of how I built the case for this model. Now, just a note here, there'll be quite a few times when you see me working on a case that looks too small for the model, and that's because it is. The case you see me building here is not the actual case for the model. This is just a smaller mock-up of the real thing. All the materials, descriptions, and methods are exactly the same as on the finished case. It's just smaller. Now, I first saw this style of case in the late 1980s when I was living on Nantucket. I found that they were made by a man named Danny Martin out in western Massachusetts. And for the few models I was selling back then, I didn't always have the luxury of ordering custom cases. Not that Danny's prices were expensive, they weren't, but it was usually margins and time limitations that had more to do with it than anything. So I found it necessary to teach myself how to build these cases. And over the years, I've gotten pretty good at it, but truthfully, mine never look quite as good as Danny's. And when time and budget allow, I absolutely prefer to have Danny make the cases. Not always the base but certainly the glass covers. To quote Carol Bayer Sager, nobody does it better. Now, if you're interested in having Danny build cases for you, just contact me through my website's contact page. That's tjloria.com forward slash contact forward slash. I'll be sure he gets your request. Materials. Of course, you're going to need some wood either half-inch plywood or MDF for the infield, and next we'll need a bit of molding. Here is some inch and three-eighth shoe molding. This stuff is readily available at your local lumber yard or Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever. It comes in a bunch of different sizes too, so it's very convenient. And you'll also need some interior liner. In this case, it's three-quarter inch square poplar but you can use anything. To glue the glass together, you'll need a tube of clear silicone caulk. And to clean up any sloppiness, acetone and paper towel applied immediately is really the only way ahead. And of course, large quantities of glass cleaner. Uh, nitrile gloves are also indispensable for keeping greasy paw prints off your always meticulously clean glass. And then there is the brass stock. And there'll be a bit more discussion on this stuff in a little while. Now, I know many ship model builders who will have the method and style of display for their model all planned out and completed long before the model is ready to be mounted. That's never been my way of dealing with things. I've pretty much lived my entire existence by the maxim, why put off till tomorrow, which you can put off indefinitely. And to my painful memory, every attempt at being forward thinking and brutally efficient has ended up in my having to somehow alter the case in a way that either renders it visually compromised if you know where to look, or totally unusable. So, regardless of whether Danny is making the case or I am, the process 
does not start until the model is finished. And I break this process down into three phases. The first phase is the infield, and we took care of that in the last episode, so I won't spend any time on it here. And the second is building the glass cover and applying the brass angle stock. And lastly, there's the molded base. Basically, I build the cases from the inside out. I start with the infield, and once I know the actual dimensions of the infield, I can make the size for the glass cover, and then I can take the sizes for the measurements for the molded base. Build that and assemble the whole thing. Now, from the last episode, we know the size of the infield. So that's one down, two to go. And I don't think I need to bore you with the simple math of figuring out how to build a box of a certain size. The only thing I will mention is to make sure that you leave a sixteenth of an inch wiggle room in all directions. The exception here is the height. Remember, that glass will sit down into the base roughly about a half inch. So figure that into your final dimension for the height. But leaving that sixteenth of an inch wiggle room around the outside of the case will ensure that there are no rude surprises when it comes time to fit the glass cover on the base and the model is installed. Now, if you are not adept at cutting glass to a consistent 64th of an inch variance, I recommend finding a glass cutter near you who will agree to work to the tolerances you need for your project. Take the time to discuss this with them and tell them exactly what you need. Photos will very often go a long way in helping them understand what it is you're trying to do. The success of your project is totally dependent on having these five pieces of glass cut accurately. Very accurately. Cleaning glass is a never-ending job. For me, there is very little satisfaction in it because it seems as soon as I'm sure I've gotten the last smudge off a panel, another one seems to magically grow in its place. But as odious as I find this task, it is absolutely necessary, and the task will never be easier than it is when these are all still flat panels. And in addition to cleaning the flat surfaces, I also make sure to clean the edges very well. This is where the adhesive will go, and it's barely an eighth of an inch wide. So I try and give that glue joint every advantage to bond as best it can. Acetone or denatured alcohol works well here. Now, assembling the cover is pretty low tech. I make sure my bench is clean of any loose dirt and debris, and I clamp a square at one end of the table. In order to hold the panels in position during glue up, I use cellophane packing tape. And I try and have all of the pieces I'll need ready prior to beginning any glue up. This is my ship model mise en place, as it were. And when all is ready, glue up can begin. And the first thing to happen is one long panel and one end panel will go together. And the silicone is applied sparingly to both edges of the end panel. And then the long panel and the short panel are assembled inside the square. And I make sure the edges are flush. And the one nice thing about the silicone is that its general gooiness will hold the panels in place long enough for me to grab a piece of tape and wrap it around the two pieces. And one piece near the top, one piece near the bottom, it's all it takes. And when I'm satisfied with the stability and the alignment of those two parts, I will put the second long panel in place up against that first end panel and more tape to hold it in place. And there is usually much checking to make sure that the parts have not wandered off the mark. It's very likely that they will, so you have to constantly check this to make sure that they are 
flush, square, and plumb. If all looks good, I apply the silicone to the other end panel and repeat the process at the far end. Now, it was at this point where I usually apply glue to the perimeter of the box for the top piece, but something was not quite right. There was a difference of about a fat sixteenth of an inch between the height of the side panels and the height of the end panel, and I did not notice this right away. I had to decide whether or not I take the whole thing apart and have the glass recut, or do I deal with this somehow? I figured I would deal with it. I mean, I was upset. Yeah, I was upset with myself, mostly, for not double-checking all the dimensions ahead of time. But then I thought about it, and in the scheme of things, the difference wasn't very significant, and it could be easily dealt with by just putting those short panels at the bottom of the case where they would just disappear into the rabbit of the base. And this is what I did. I waited until the four pieces glued up and set up. Then I flipped the box over carefully so that the flush surface was now on top and finished with the assembly. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but this little error in measurement solved a very big problem for me, and that is ventilation. Getting sufficient flow of fresh air through a case is vital for a ship model's survival. Lack of circulation can lead to a host of ship model ills, such as premature failure of the rigging and other fiber materials. Uh, if the case, and so the model, is subject to huge swings in humidity that cannot easily be dissipated, glue joints can fail due to the rapid movement of the wood. And the list is large of things that can really go wrong. And I've never been completely comfortable with my past methods for dealing with this. But being assured there is a constant flow of fresh air in and out of the case every day should go a long way in mitigating the problem. Is this enough? Truthfully, I don't know. I'm sure that there are museum conservators who have exact formulae for dealing with such things, but I don't have access to these people. So I will have to be content with knowing I've done something quantifiable towards solving the problem. Now, installing the brass trim is another aspect of case making I find both tedious and, if I get it right, oddly satisfying. The brass is not only decorative but structural as well. Silicone caulk offers just about no resistance to shearing force. And that means these joints between the panels can easily be separated with a minimum of sideways effort. So the brass angle stock is essential to the case's integrity. Now there are eight joints on the case, four around the top and one on each corner. And they all get mitered corners. Back in the day, I only mitered the joints around the perimeter of the top. The four uprights were simply butted up to the underside of the brass on the top. You know, as long as this picture is up here, let's spend a bit of time discussing what we see. Because the more I look at this photo, the more I see this is a prime example of how not to build a case. Now, disclaimer. Before I start tearing up my work, let me just say in my own defense, this is a case I made way back in the mid-90s. And it was a time when I viewed case making as a necessary evil to be given only the barest minimum of effort to protect the model. I've since come to realize the importance of having the model and the case work together to best show the subject within. Proportions. The length is okay. 
but the width looks a bit cramped and the height is a bit short too, I think. Uh, the base and the infield. Now, here are a couple of case building faux pas that need to be addressed. The infield base is quarter inch plywood. Nothing wrong with that, but as the photo shows, I didn't bother to sand or finish off the edges. They look ragged and sloppy, absolutely amateurish. And the second issue with the infield is the height. It stands above the highest edge of the molding instead of flush width or slightly below it. Now, this in itself wouldn't have been an issue if I had bothered to finish all the exposed edges of the plywood. Now, the fit and finish of the glass. In this shot, you can see that the brass trim for the top overhangs the brass trim of the upright pieces, creating a shadow detail. That means I did not glue the top flush to the end panels. I seem to have done okay with the long piece on the edge. Anyway, brass trim and installation style. You'll notice that the brass trim has a rounded appearance to it. Now, this case was built with angle stock I bought from the local hobby shop. It's made from flat stock and formed into the right angle you see here. The bend has a very pronounced radius to it. And this is perfectly acceptable. But what I didn't know at the time was you could call up the company and order specific sizes. And the stock you get in those cases is made from extruded square tube and then cut to your sizes. And the difference between the two styles is pretty drastic. Now, of course, the downside is that there are minimum quantities involved. And it isn't always practical to stockpile a few hundred dollars worth of brass trim at a time, unless you plan on going into the case building business. Now, the second issue in this photo is the lack of miters on the upright pieces. This is something, I hate to admit, I've only started recently doing. And I also hate to admit, I was foolish to wait so long to start. It's just not that hard to do. And even in this photo of the pieces being tri-fit, the difference is like night and day. Now the easiest way I've found to cut these dual miters is on the table saw with the help of two miter gauges set at opposing 45 degree angles. The first cut is just to establish one of the 45 degree cuts on one face of the trim piece. The second cut may need a bit of tweaking, but I found a pretty good way around that too. I've made zero clearance cuts on each of the miter gauges and then I put a little red sharpie on it to make it easier to see. With surprisingly little practice, I was able to cut consistently accurate dual 45 degree angles. Now, since I'm doing this on the table saw, the back side of the cuts always comes out a bit ragged. And yes, this will affect the fit. So it's necessary to get an accurate fit you have to remove that burr off the back. And as Quinn from Blondie Hacks so rightly points out, chamfers are what separate us from the animals. Now, I don't often mention someone else's YouTube channel, but Quinn's videos are very well done with a lot of useful information for the hobbyist and model builder. Whether or not you're into machine shop building or not, her videos are definitely worth looking into. Now, once I have one end with two good miters on it, I measure the far end and mark it for what I think will be the actual length I need. Then it's back to the table saw. And this time I make a square cut, usually splitting that line for the exact length. And from here, it's easy to line up 
that square end with the zero clearance 45s. And each is then cut in turn, carefully. At this point, there should be nothing left to do, after chamfering that is, except to dry fit it to the other trim pieces. Now, gluing the trim, no great secret to that. It's just installed with more silicone caulk, taped in place, and left to dry. And the process goes around the top first, and then down the four uprights. And the four uprights, that's really the only place where cutting a piece a tiny bit short won't matter. In fact, between leaving the uprights a little too long or a little too short, there's really only one choice. Make it short. If you're leaving it long, that corner of the case won't sit flat in the bottom of the rabbit, and the whole case will rock. Not good. And a word about gluing up an alignment. Just as with the glass panels, being prone to shifting during glue up, the same is true for the brass. So, as you go around the case, be sure to double back to some of your earlier joints and make sure they're all as you want them because it's not going to be easy to deal with this once the glue is set. Save yourself a world of headaches later. So, now that the cover has been built and trimmed, and I'm sure you've just spent the last week cleaning all the smudges and glue globs off the glass, it's time to make the base. And I don't have any clever secrets here. This is just woodworking 101. Four pieces of molding fit with accurate 45 degree miters and glued together. The inside liner, in this case, happened to be three quarter inch square poplar and that just gets glued and pinned flush to the bottom. Now the one thing I will say about sizing, and I've said this before, remember to leave about a fat sixteenth of an inch wiggle room on all sides. There is absolutely no advantage to making the base fit tightly to the cover. In fact, in light of my earlier remarks about case ventilation, the opposite is true. With Cases for ship models, remember, wiggle room is our friend. Again, low tech. I favor satin finish black for my painted bases. And I just use rattle cans coming right from the local hardware store. As you will remember from the last episode, I did paint the outside edges of the infield flat black. Now be sure to tape off the inner lining prior to painting the base and I usually cover about a half inch of that three-quarter inch inner lining with the tape. That'll leave plenty of clean surface for the gluing of the infield later. Now, in this mock-up of the case, I've left the top off to make things easier to see. No annoying reflections off the glass. And as far as getting everything to line up for final assembly, that's pretty easy. With the inner lining creating the shelf for the infield, I simply put a bead of glue around that, drop the infield on it, and line it up by eye. Then, I put the glass cover on top of the whole thing. Now, if I've been reasonably careful about sizes, cutting, and assembly, this should just about take care of itself. Only the slightest of adjustments should be necessary. And those can be easily done by carefully lifting off the cover, making the tweaks, and then at this point, just lightly clamping the infield in place. And that's it. This very long project is now finished and it's in its case.
Back in 2020, if I had any clue that this whaleboat series would take on the depth it has, it very likely would never have seen the light of day. By that time, I had built some 55 whaleboat models, and I felt pretty confident I had a better than working knowledge of my subject. The one thing that never ceases to amaze me is just how wrong I can be about a thing and not know it. But from the very first episode, it was clear that if I did not approach this project with the eyes of someone totally unfamiliar with the subject, it would never achieve what I hoped. And all on its own, with every new episode, each aspect of the building process evolved into something that did not exist before. The learning curve for me was so totally unexpected. The operations I had carried out the same way for the last three plus decades gave way to new perspectives, approaches, and methods. A deeper understanding of the evolution of the type led to a more complete understanding of the methods and materials used in the real boats, and so more relevance to my models. In each of the 15 episodes in this series, there were at least two or more old practices that gave way to new and improved and hopefully more realistic rendering of my subject. I can honestly say this whaleboat is unlike any of the 54 that have gone before it. It may look similar on the surface, but it could not be more different. Does that mean it's perfect? <laughs> Certainly not. There are a couple of dozen things I'd like to think I could do better if I were to build another. But at this point, that seems a little unlikely. Does it give an accurate impression of a certain type of vessel designed to carry out a specific task? Yeah, I think in that respect, this model is quite effective. So, what becomes of it now? Well, like all my models, this one is for sale. I have placed it in the J. Russell Janichian Gallery in Stonington, Connecticut. I put a link to the gallery's website in the description below. And do make sure you, you pay them a visit. It's a great place to see a lot of world-class maritime art in all medias, as well as some very talented ship model people. Yeah, well, about that. I've learned never to say never, but I think for the foreseeable future, there will not be any new content from me. Now, I know it's hard to believe, but I think I've run out of things to say. And as a very wise person once said, never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. But I do have one more small announcement to make. I'm currently writing a book about the coasting schooner Alice S. Wentworth and how I came to build a scale model of the vessel. There's a very interesting story behind the life and times of this charmed little ship and I hope you'll find the journey from history to ship model as interesting and fascinating as I did. Now, I won't be giving anything away by saying it was the people of Wentworth that made her story so compelling. Now, I should be finished with all the content soon, and it will hopefully be off to the presses in the first half of this year. And it will be published by Sea Watch Books. Now, if you don't know about Sea Watch, they are a terrific outfit, specializing in books on maritime history with an especially heavy bent towards ship modeling. Their list of published authors reads like a who's who of the ship modeling and maritime history worlds. And to say I'm honored to be in their company is an understatement. I will put a link to their website below. 
and I strongly encourage you to take some time and check them out. It's a great resource for contemporary ship modeling knowledge. And so, here we are, at the end of a phase. There is nothing left to say except to express my sincerest thanks to my nearly 6,500 subscribers who have stuck with this project and the others. It was your support and encouragement that has kept me at it all this time. And so, with that, Remember to treat each other nicely. Until I see you again, take care. Now, break's over. Get back in the shop.